Hello, I'm Chris Lisher, and welcome to Turning of the Wheel, an intelligent, lively discussion on astrology, art, and adventure. Timing is everything, and as the great wheel turns, we are best prepared when we are best informed. Join me as I explore the current planetary alignments and offer insights for coping with change. Educational, informative, and enlightening, the turning of the wheel is a welcome pause in your daily swirl of constant change. Through intelligent discourse, inspired guests, and educational segments, I will help to enlighten your knowledge of astrology and guide you to accept change as the great wheel of life turns. Call in with your questions and speak with some of the greatest visionaries in the time-tested practice of astrology. Turning of the Wheel. Astrology, art, and adventure with Chris Flisher each week on Turning of the Wheel podcast. Hello and welcome to Turning of the Wheel. My name is Chris Fisher. As you know, this is a show about astrology. And astrology is a great divination tool for providing us insight with where things might be going, how they might be turning out. And they give us a broad range of themes that allow us to get much more information about how things might go and how we can best respond knowing that we know it, knowing that we, what we know about where we're going to be going. That's one of the wonderful things about astrology. It's not got the specificity, perhaps, that you might look for if you're looking to say, should I buy a lottery ticket on Tuesday? But it does have great value. The overarching themes are there. Once you know the theme, sort of the realm in which you're in, you can act accordingly. You know, you can take it, use it as a tool for that. One of my, my guests coming up is Mitch Astro, Mitch Scott Lewis. Mitchell Scott Lewis is his name. He's an astrologer out of New York City, and I've met him several times at conferences, and I've heard him, hear him speak many times. Wonderful guy, full of knowledge, very lively, animated guy, knows his astrology inside and out, and his specialties really are finances and medical astrology. But he's also a novelist, a writer. He's written three novels that are working with astrology as the baseline. And he's also a musician. I got his music recently, and it's really something else. It's, it's just classic rock and roll, and it's, it's got all the right hooks in it, which I love. Anyway, so we're going to be talking today about what's going on in the world today and why the stock market's going so high and what, what we can expect coming forward and uh, see what he has to say. When he looks into his crystal ball, we look at the charts, we can see a lot of activity. A lot of the activity that we're, we were expecting or could have happened is being stalled right now because we got Saturn and Uranus in a trine. But once that breaks free, we may see things a little bit different. So without further ado, and by the way, his, his website is Mitch Astro, M-I-T-C-H-A-S-T-R-O.com, MitchAstro.com. Mitchell Scott Lewis, my friend, welcome to the show today. It's great to have you on. Chris, how nice to be to be on again. Nice yeah. to talk to you. So let's let's talk about the economy. Like right now, we're sitting in an economy where the unemployment's very low. We got the stock market hitting all time highs. People think, "Wow, this is great," but then you look everywhere else in the world and our, in our country in particular, and things are not quite as pleasant. What about the financial picture going forward? What do you foresee on the horizon with regard to how this market works out? Well, for one thing, you already touched on one of the subjects that I've been. Uh, writing quite a bit about, and that is the Uranus Saturn trine. Yeah, uh, that that's held up this market, and of course, in uh, 2021, it comes into a square. Yes, and uh, the events that are going to lead up to that square are going to be as they often are. I, I, I do a, a lecture about financial uh, markets, uh, focusing on the New York Stock Exchange chart, simply because it's an it's a comfortable and easy way for Student, for astrology students and for professionals to focus in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the relationship between Saturn and Uranus is quite, quite remarkable uh, in financial matters. It does not mean that every time we have a hard aspect between the two, we're going to have a stock market crash or a depression. Uh, but uh, it's a good, it's a good uh, point to aim at. Yes, I agree. And, yeah. um, you know, we've also had a, 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 a Jupiter, uh, uh, what was it, Jupiter-Pluto, uh, uh, I mean a Jupiter-Pluto sextile right, right. that has been uh, also supportive. And these aspects are, are starting to separate. Mm -hmm. But you notice that the Dow, I don't know if you're paying attention, but yesterday and today, the S&Ps, the Dow, they're making new highs. Yeah, that's incredible. Just incredible. Oh, everybody's screaming, bye, bye, you know. And, and my advice to my clients, if they ask for it, of course, uh, is sell. Yeah, uh, my, my personal feeling is this market has yeah. gone up for the last seven years. And, <clears throat> you know, the stock market is not an indicator of our economy. It's an indicator of the stock market. Right. And That's a very, very important point. Very important point. If you had bought the stocks in 1931, in the, in the, in the worst, the, the very beginning of the absolute worst depression this world has ever seen, probably, 
uh, they went up for the next six years. Mm -hmm. They didn't start to, to falter until 1937 when what's, what's uh, called the Roosevelt Recession started to kick in because the Republican Congress demanded a balanced budget from Roosevelt and stopped his uh, progressive uh, 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 funding of projects, which was, of course, raising the stock market because corporations were making a fortune. Right. People were still eating each other, but corporations were doing it. So, you know, we're, we're in a kind of a, uh, an interesting time right now, Chris. I, mean, I know you, you follow a lot of this, too, and you may have come to the same conclusions. Uh, what I, this, is, this is the way I look at it. First of all, we, it's, <laughs> globalization has been going on since, I don't know, ancient Egypt. Since there were ships that could get from one shore to the other, really. <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's never, it, it's only... It goes back to the 18, I mean, you know, it goes back to when, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I mean, he left the country and went to another country to find trade. So that's, it's always there. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And, it's, and, and the Romans, and everybody has always tried to essentially globalize. I mean, China was united by its written language long before uh, any other part of the world had uh, any kind of a stable central government. So... You know, and, and I tell you what, ancient Egypt is a great example. If you read the Bible, uh, you, you know about Passover, you know about the Exodus. How did the, the Jews and the Hebrews get into Egypt? Well, they got into Egypt because <coughs> Joseph, with the amazing technicolor dream coat, right. gets, uh, gets uh, beaten up by his brothers because they're jealous of him, thrown into a ditch. He's discovered, they bring him into Egypt where he goes into prison. And in prison, it turns out that he's a, a, a dream uh, analyst. And the Pharaoh has these two dreams that seven fat cows are consumed by seven skinny cows. Joseph interprets this dream as after seven years of feast, we are going to have seven years of famine. Right. And he convinces the Pharaoh to stash all of their grains and goodies into these storehouses, which he does. And the entire Middle East, uh, and North Africa goes into this terrible uh, 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 depression, and the only place that has food is Egypt. Mm -hmm. So everybody moves to Egypt, where uh, Jacob, who is Joseph's father, brings the rest of the family, and they then Joseph, re, you know, and they all they all reunite. At this point, Joseph is now the Pharaoh's right hand man because he saves the country, and uh, you know. Commodities, socks, they, they haven't changed. They changed the way we deal with them. Now they're electronic, now they're this, they're that. But it's the same damn thing. The price of cotton goes too high, you can't make shirts. If you can't make shirts, you have to fire people. If you have to fire people, the stock market goes down and blah, blah. So yeah. we're in that kind of a cycle right now. We are coming out of uh, a recovery, so to speak. And as, as most of us know, it has, the middle class has not recovered very no. much. <clears throat> I sure it's haven't. <laughs> well, most of us haven't. Right. It's, it's, it's been a terrible period uh, for the struggling working man, the small business owner, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's because of the policies being implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get directly political if we can avoid it, but uh, it certainly is a question of, of how we direct the energy and the resources that we have. I am not a fan of the recent tax cut because I don't think it's going to do anything for anybody except the very wealthy. Right. And that is you know, proving, proving itself to be true. Well, that was true even back when Reagan, Reagan talked about the trickle-down economy. The trickle-down economy is a fallacy. Of course. Mm -hmm. It's an illusion created by rich people. Mm -hmm. uh, another, look, one of, the, one of the things that I've been uh, on radio and in my newsletter and wherever I can, uh, the, the, the subject of cryptocurrencies and bitcoins comes up a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, I, I've been saying for two years, Bitcoin is a bubble. It's a scam. It's going to collapse. Well, this past summer, it lost 75% of its value. Yeah. And the way that any bubble works is like a, any pyramid scheme. I convince you and a few other people, we start something. Now we go out and we get other people to invest in it, so the price goes up and up and up and up and up. At some point, if we're smart, we take ours out, and eventually the bottom collapses, and those who are coming in later are the ones who lose the wall. Right. 
This is exactly what happened with Bitcoins. This is unfortunately what more likely than not will happen with a number of things. And my concern for my clients and my friends is their stock market, their 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 uh, retirement funds. You know, uh, no being old stinks. Being poor stinks. Being old and poor really stinks. So you know, you want to make sure that you have some money. And so, if people say to me, "What should I do with my stocks?" I ask them, "How old are you?" They tell me I'm 25. I say, you know what? You're probably better off leaving it. If it'll crash, it'll come right back up again. Right if you're up. in your middle years, you might want to take some money and put it on the side so you can buy when it dips. And if you're older, get your money out of there and protect yourself. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. And that's what that's what I think we are. Right yeah. Now. That that. Uh, that seven-year cycle you talk about with the seven years of feast, seven years of famine, it is tied directly to Saturn. I mean, Saturn is a 20, 28, it's the square all the way around, yeah. Well, you know that, you know that uh, uh, supposedly uh, after the, the, the Hebrews were brought up to Babylon, where they discovered astrology, I mean, they were taught astrology by the Babylonians, and then 40 years later they went back down, they brought the knowledge with them. Right. So whenever I look at the Bible and I read it, uh, <clears throat> you know, from that perspective, I see one astrological symbol after another. No, no. And certainly, I don't know whether Joseph was an astrologer, but that, yeah, it fits so perfectly into the Saturn cycles. And, of course, you know that people get their information from a lot of different ways. You and I study astrology. Some people are psychics. Some use tarot. Some, you know, look up in the sky and they get, the, who knows. Uh, but it always, it always coordinates with astrology i've never seen it not yeah yeah uh i i study i, I did i wrote a play about nostradamus that i'm trying to get produced yeah. and from a different perspective it's, it's a very personal play about him and his family and whatever and i read every book i could find out and if he didn't see something astrologically he didn't take it seriously even though their astrology was off because their ephemeris was off he you know Saturn could be three, four degrees away from where it really is. Now we're much more exact in our, in our numbers. But it's the same thing. And so he used all the astrological symbols to point to what he saw. Uh, he used uh, nut, nutmeg is, a, is, a, is an, an hallucinogenic. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know that, no. Um, they used to make the, this powder, and they would you know, uh, uh, put it into pills, and, and there would be a number of things in it. And uh, one of them was... was uh, nutmeg and if you eat too much nutmeg it's it, it's fatal it's poisonous if you eat right. just the right amount you know if you eat just the right amount then you know it's a, an hallucinogenic so he used to take a lot of nutmeg supposedly and that's where he saw how he got his his actual visions but he always correlated it to astrology interesting and you know when you look at those accuracy of the precision of the of the of the astrology and it does play out right i mean especially if you see the cycles of specific planets saturn is one i always trace because it's it's you know it's it's an incredibly important planet. It does harbinger. It's a harbinger of the where the duty and the responsibility need to lie. And I think we've had a good ride here with the Saturn Uranus kind of uh, trine. But as Saturn as that trine begins to break apart and separate, we're going to see Saturn getting closer to Pluto, and those two in combination with Jupiter as well coming up in 2020 spell out a rather you know, a pretty powerful change in, in, in the air, especially financially. I think that people are... Well, gonna... there's going to be there's gonna be three, three uh, distinct uh, challenges coming up to us. The first one is next June. Uh, Uranus will conjunct the New York Stock Exchange's Venus, which could go either way. As you know, the one word that astrologers hate more than anything else is unpredictable. <laughs> and it's interesting that Uranus, which rules the study of astrology, is the most unpredictable. Of all of, of, all of them. Uh, of, right. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that humbles astrologers, or it should to some extent. Um, but uh, that's, that's the first indicator. Then, of course, we have 2020 with that stellium of Saturn and Pluto mm -hmm. and Jupiter and Mars all uh, in, uh, you know, circling around America's Pluto return and in opposition to America's cancer planets, especially Mercury at 24 degrees. Uh, and then we have a Saturn Uranus square. And the difference between 2008, which was one of my great predictions, I, I'm happy to say, I, uh, I'm sorry that it happened, but it did. Uh, and I was uh, doing a series of lectures at the Princeton Club and warned this group of investors that the crash was coming, and I told them exactly when it was going to hit, within a week of its occurrence, more than a year in advance. Astrology, of course, works. It sure does. Um, 
but at that point we were we had a different government we had different philosophy about things and uh certain things were put <coughs> into place that uh our government did to now whatever your politics may be it's not a question of that but uh, uh they they saved the car companies they saved the banks now they they bailed everybody out and not a single person went to jail for it that of course is criminal in itself um, there should have been a lot of changes, but there were certain things put into place to prevent that from happening again. Now they are being systematically removed. So that sets and the stage for the, another, another collapse. There's no, safety, there's no safety net involved. Absolutely. And so the things that add up to it are that uh, the emerging markets, so to speak, Turkey, Venezuela, Brazil, they're all crumbling. Yeah, there's, sure. there's no man. South America is on the verge of its worst collapse in a generation uh, <clears throat> because it's going to, going to tip over. <clears throat> and when you have, as we've seen, uh, a lot of uh, financial distress, you get a lot of, of refugees. When you have a lot of refugees, you have a political backlash. Yes, we sure Just do. Just like, like we're seeing Europe right now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And, of course, the, the, the funniest thing is that America has um, virtually no uh, Immigrant, well, we have immigrants, but we have, we have no refugees coming here whatsoever, a few thousand. But Europe has absorbed millions, and, uh, and yet our political system has had a backlash worse even than, than many of the European nations who are dealing with this. Now we're starting to see serious problems in Sweden, in Germany, uh, in Italy. And all of this is in, all of these pieces are coming together, like the dominoes that you set up and then you hit the first one over and they all collapse. We have, we are doing away with a lot of restrictions. Yeah, which we're deregulating open, everything. Right, deregulation. Right, yeah. Deregulating everything. Yeah. The emerging <clears throat> markets are crumbling, and no matter how hard, uh, you know, people try to make it not so, we are one world, one tiny little blue bubble. Uh, you know, marble floating in the sky. And as I said in my newsletter recently, if somebody in China sneezes, someone in, in Cleveland says good night. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then you, you can't separate what's happening to these, to these nations because there, there will be spillage, and the spillage will include tremendous human uh, misery, which will spill over, and you know, then you'll see other nations becoming unstable and so on. Uh, and the astrology lines up perfectly with it. It does, it and that's what's remarkable about it. Now, you wonder, if things had gone differently in the United States, would that have changed the astrology, or would the astrology still march on the way it is? I suspect it would still march on the way it is. Oh, absolutely. You know, depend look, look, Chris, there are a lot of ways that we can interpret an aspect. I have, as you have, yeah, you know, we've, of course we've, you had, can. we've had many clients who go through the same transit, and they respond differently to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can't assume. Uh, but when I have, I have a lot of business clients um, because of my years on, on the commodities exchange and so on, and I understand how to talk to them. And, uh, you know, a couple of my, my uh, uh, clients uh, I've told, oh, over the last year, year and a half, you've got so much Saturn in your aspect, in your, in your planet by aspect. You can't expand. You have to sit back and wait. And these are people who do not like to wait. But they had seen what I was able to do years for the years, previous years. And so they followed my advice. And every single one of them has said to me recently, thank God I listened to you. I would have invested in this and in this and in that and in this. And I would have gotten my shirt, you know, lost my shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy stocks. You can buy stocks in a, in a crash. You can buy stocks in a depression. Sometimes you'll find those couple of little stocks that are doing just terrific no matter what. Right. And so, you know. So, you know, if we, if, we re, if we rewrote history, I would go so far as to say that, yeah, um, something would have happened. Because I think for every aspect, like you mentioned earlier, every aspect, somebody may have a great time, somebody may have a bad time. But the potential for change is in, embedded in every aspect, in any, any close aspect. Like the potential for change is there. So with the potential for change there, you can go two different ways with change or a variety of ways. That's why we get the variety of people having different responses to that. So if, if, the, if the administration had been different, maybe things would have been different, but they still would probably end up in the same space, I think, eventually, either that, but by, probably by different means, but the same outcome would happen. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Look, I, you know, you look at the aspects of the 1930s, and you say, what would have happened? What, 
why, why did Hitler rise to power? Why was Mussolini there? Why was Franco there? Why was Stalin there? It was the era of the dictators. Yeah. There, we had a, 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 a tug of war in America's consciousness uh, mm-hmm. involving, well, democratic liberalism, if you will, versus dictatorship. And it, and it took, uh, I mean, it, the end result certainly could have been the other way around. You know, I, I don't know, you could point to a half dozen places, Dunkirk. If, we, if, uh, if uh, Roosevelt had lost in 1940, where would our, you know, where would we have stayed out of the war? Although uh, Wilkie seems to have been quite uh, pro-involvement uh, uh, anyway. But the point is that these, these periods arise all the time. Uh, Donald Trump winning the presidency instead of Hillary, would we be in a different place? Well, what if Hillary had won, but the House and the Senate remained Republican? Yeah, she wouldn't have got anything done. She would have had her Absolutely hands Absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. So now <clears throat> they are moving certain things along, and uh, a lot of my conservative friends are happy with some of the results that are happening. Uh, uh, I think they're short-sighted, but that's okay. We all have our perspective. Right? So it doesn't matter. Trump won, Trump lost. We're still going to face 2020. And that's stellium. And that stellium representing Pluto return. And, you know, as you and most of our astrology friends understand, Pluto represents the elimination of waste in the body, in the home. In the body, it rules the, 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 the colon, the erythra, the sweat glands, even the tear ducts. Anything that takes waste out of our uh, our body is Pluto's domain. Right. In a horror, every read of Pluto sitting on the ascendant, and then, you know somebody lost their wedding ring. I tell them, look near the, the the garbage disposal or the toilet or wherever you put waste, you may find it there. So we're dealing with our Pluto return, something you and I will never go through. I certainly hope. Right. Um, and <laughs> America has to eliminate the waste and the, and the infection that we have in our collective consciousness. And, uh, you know, that infection can be called a lot of names, fear, greed, mm-hmm. racism, hatred, whatever you want to call it. Income it's inequality true. is a wide variety of adjectives for it. You're right. <clears throat> right, right. And, of course, Pluto was the natural eighth house, which is the house of joint, uh, jointly held finances. So it rules all trading accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, while Saturn rules the banks and the, and the housing market, Pluto really is the ruler of of the stock market, right. uh, but we don't always look for Pluto aspects to tell us where the market's going to go. Pluto also, by the way, rules oil, mm-hmm. uh, as I proved uh, proved with my uh, my calls on oil back in the in the nineties. Um, so now we're, we're at this place where we need to clean out, and you know, people don't change unless they're in pain. Nobody wants to change. Ah, no, it's okay. Of course. House on fire, I'll wait till we And now, now our house is on fire. Well, it will be. It's, it's we, on fire. It will be soon, even more so on fire. And I think that the point that, I, that you know, because we see these aspects and we know what these symbols represent, I think of, of Pluto as transition, you know, either, either tearing down to rebuild or whatever. You know, it's very similar to the same analogy you use. Um, but I think that the inevitable is there and we can see it i think that we could only this bubble we're riding can only go so far it's like a balloon getting ready to pop and when it pops it's going right. to pop and then we'll have a correction and we'll be back on track eventually the earth's not going to come to a screeching end but who knows i mean we have a lot of ecological problems that we're ignoring environmental problems we're ignoring that could also be a part of, of this problem as well well they are they're also they are also don't forget these are worldwide they're not American problems. Of course not. Now, is, there, I, yeah. is there a chart for the earth? I don't know. I'll have to email God and ask them what they actually, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's always been our it, biggest it, problem. You could never find a chart for the earth. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little It's a problem. It's a bit of a problem. But, um, but, but you know, obviously, of course, it's an esoteric question because we're not, uh, we're not looking at whether or not earth should, you know, buy a new couch. Uh, what we are doing, though, is is coming to to a point uh, which are, which humanity comes to periodically, uh, where we're at a crossroads. If we make the wrong turn here, I don't think there's. I don't. You know. Well, you know. I'm I'm a firm believer that that if we do not uh, deal with the environment, with what's the point? Where you know where where are you going to live? That's right. Well, that's why they keep blasting off to Mars and the Moon, thinking we're going to live there. But that's just a running away from the problem. It doesn't solve the problem well, at all. 
This is our greatest channel channel challenge, I think. Then I've always thought ever since I was a young kid that the only way we'd ever get peace on earth is if we had a common enemy. And I don't mean that we have to be antagonistic or look for an enemy. And the enemy is a mm-hmm. metaphor. The word the men- enemy is a metaphor for a challenge or a, a, something that's pushing us. And the environment may very well be just that. And if we all find ourselves in a situation where our planet is falling apart, we may put our arms down and decide we've got to work on this together to get this fixed. That may be the common enemy. I don't know. It could be aliens, but who knows? You know what I'm saying? You get that? Well, but, you, but as you know, uh, one of the other common enemies that we're facing right now is truth versus untruth. Mm -hmm. And when you have a large percentage of the population that does not believe that the planet is in bad shape, then then you're never going to all stand together shoulder to shoulder. And by the time we see it, it may be too late. I have friends who bought property in Miami Beach. And I I told them all, I said, you know what, why don't you rent? Why would you, why would you buy property in Miami Beach? Miami Beach isn't going to be there in 15 years. Well, of course, some of the older ones say to me, I'm, I won't be either, so what do I care? Um, but, but it, you know, we're seeing it all over the place. I mean, New York City is nothing but a bunch of little islands. Yeah. No and uh, on, I, I don't know if you know Miami, but there's a, a place called Lincoln Road right in the middle of Miami Beach. Or actually downtown a little bit, and it's a huge shopping and restaurant, a lovely place. And now, when there's a full moon or a high tide, there's a foot of water. Oh my gosh! Wow, really? Yeah, I didn't and know. that's going to continue, and it's going to get worse and worse. Obviously, now you know what happened in the Carolinas. You know, it's a good example where you know the Jersey Shore, by the way, hangs off the edge of the of the continental uh, shelf. It doesn't slide out as most as most beaches do. So it drops it's right down. Very, yeah, it would, there would be no Jersey Shore if, the, if things uh, turn sufficiently, if the oceans rise enough. And Jersey gets, I don't know, I think 50, 60, 70 percent, whatever it is, of their, their income from the shore. Wow. So, you know, you know, you're dealing with financial matters that are directly related to choices that we make. They're not separate. Oh, as long as I have money, what, are you gonna have? what, what good is your money going to do you? You know, uh, in, 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 it's Anyway, it won't do them a, won't do them a bit of good if, if they have not, nothing to go back to. There's no planet there. But we're still founded in this old fashioned idea that things are going to keep on going as they go, because that's our history teaches us that how they go. But when we see the potential for this, fra- and I think the economy is fragile, despite what people think. I think it's very fragile. I think it's, it's based on a number of, of political considerations. It's based on environmental considerations. It's been based on transport. But the globalization of the world is something we cannot deny. And to turn ourselves away from that, and I think the United States has made a huge mistake in this regard, turning away from it, we are, we've sort of cut ourselves off at the feet. We can't be an island by ourselves. We have to sustain with other countries feeding us as we feed them. It's a mutually beneficial arrangement. We can't be exclusionary and close the doors down. You know, it's interesting because when you look at the Uranus cycle, now 84 years ago, uh, which is a, you know, a very an interesting cycle to trace, we see Herbert Hoover in office, and he was an isolationist. He was, one, he was an anti-immigrationist isolationist, and that, he set the groundwork for the, uh, the Depression, which eventually came because he shut our doors down. Right. Right. And, and when Roosevelt came in, because Uranus represents uh, radical change, he started the, the most uh, progressive programs uh, that we've ever you know, had. And, right. of course, Johnson in the 60s uh, expanded them. But the funny thing is that Richard Nixon was considered an extremely conservative right-wing uh, president, tried to start universal health care. Yeah. So, you know, what, what, if, if, you, if you come up with the idea, it's stupid. But if I come up with the same idea, you know, then all of a sudden it's smart. And... Yeah, you know, Chris, we're we're not going to get away unscathed. No, uh, and <clears throat> and all of the reasons that you and I have discussed, and you know, we're talking about now, are all going to add up to those times. Now, I, you know, for a couple of years, I've been looking at 2020, and I think that it is going to be exactly what I think it's going to be. It's going to be uh, a tremendous uh, breakdown, as Pluto will do, uh, to to a lot of our uh, institutions that we've taken for granted. Now, you're right. The economy is not in good shape. The stock market looks wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great. I wish I had, you know, 40,000 shares of Apple that I bought at $12. Um, But 
that's not that's not sufficient. No. Now, in the midterm elections, uh, I'm sure you've looked at this. It's the midterm elections take place on the dark of the moon in Scorpio. Yeah, no kidding. Gosh. And the and the dark of the moon is the end of matters. People die on the dark of the moon. A lot of things end on the dark of the moon. And Scorpio is ruled by Pluto, and it is the transformative sign. It's and, a classic you know, place. <clears throat> right. I think that it can represent one of two things. One is, I think, it's going to represent a blue wave. How big it will be, who knows? But uh, there have only been two times since the Second World War that the party with the president in, in office uh, won seats in a midterm election. Every so, other time, the ruling party loses seats. So there's no reason to assume it's not going to happen here. Right. Um, we don't know that for a fact. Thing, we don't know that for a fact, but it, <clears throat> it's very likely that we're going to see a, a wave or at least a change of, of, which is going to further, in some ways, even though it may be welcome, it's going to complicate matters even more so because it's going to have... Oh, absolutely. It's going to make the and whole it's process... Go, and, it's, and it's going to, it's going to make a lot of people feel like their backs are against the wall. Which then, and, of course, uh, when their backs against the wall, they respond. And so it's, it's a difficult place for us to be coming forward. We're going to take a break right now because we are at the halfway mark here. We're talking today with Mitchell Scott Lewis. He's an astrologer out of New York City. Fantastic financial astrologer if you need some financial advice, as well as medical. His website is MitchAstro.com. He's a writer. He writes novels about using astrology. He's also a fabulous musician. We'll be back in about two and a half minutes, so hang in there, and uh, we'll continue our conversation. It's, it's a fascinating discussion, so be, hang in there. Be right back. Okay, welcome back to Turning of the Wheel. My guest today is Mitchell Scott Lewis. His website is Mitch Astro. You want some financial advice or medical advice using astrology? He's your man. Um, so we were talking, as you were talking about before the break, about this, uh, the, you know, this sort of the, even if we do have a, 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 a red, a blue tide coming in and, and the House and the Senate go the other direction, we're still going to have a logjam of not having continuity or a common idea which way to go. So things will get complicated, right? Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, I mean, there. Are, I, I I think we have no choice but to constantly change. You know, the old saying, the only thing that's constant is change. And uh, our society has to continue to grow just as the individual does. I have clients in their 90s, and some of them are the most life-loving and optimistic people I know. Uh, I also have clients in their 30s and 40s who are so depressed they don't do anything. You can't get out of bed. Right. It's got to do with attitude, of course. Um, but it, it's that, that desire to keep pushing against the, the wall, against the restrictions that are around you. That, well, I did a lecture recently uh, in New York for the NCTR, and uh, we were talking about uh, Taurus uh, Uranus, uh, Uranus going into Taurus, right, and right, right. it was with uh, uh, there were four of us: uh, Michael Luton, John Marcusella. It was a, a, a really a lovely day, really terrific, terrific day. And uh, I brought up uh, Donald Trump's chart and FDR's charts, and I wanted to show the difference. They both have complicated charts. FDR's chart spoke screamed of medical problems. There was no question; something was going to happen. Polio, of course, in his 30s probably was not what he had anticipated, and it's quite a remarkable thing that a man who could not walk for the rest of his life you know, saved the world from the Depression. No the kidding. World War. That's a remarkable story in itself, I know. Oh, God, it's unbelievable. And, uh, uh, and, and he, he grew up in a, in a Republican, you know, conservative <clears throat> family and turned, turned to, to the Democrats. So, uh, the difference, though, is that, is that uh, his chart showed the ability, in a way, to struggle against his limitations. And that's what always... I've never seen anybody's chart that's too simple. Make anything of themselves. It's always those that have complications, that are difficult, they have squares and oppositions, and oh my God, in conjunction. And they struggle, and they struggle, and they, and they do things. Uh, and that's what he was able to do and continued uh, his positive attitude. Who the hell knows what he was like, you know, in the privacy of his bedroom. But, but well, his attitude yeah. out in the world. But he was an Aquarius and he had his, his eyes were on the bigger prize. His eyes were on the greater collective. And, and I would argue that, you know, and we could probably see this with your clients and my clients, too. It's those people who have the greatest challenges that often achieve the greatest accomplishments. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the point. Whereas you look at our current president's chart. It's also a complicated chart. He certainly could have worked 
through some of the difficulties. For example, he's got a Neptune-Mercury square, which makes it very, very difficult to understand truth from fiction. And uh, I have a number of clients with that. I hear from people all the time when I write about it. Oh, I have that. And, and, I, and I write them back and we communicate. And, and I say, well, you know, you, if you work with this, this can become your greatest strength. Exactly. You will be empathetic and you will be inspirational and you will be psychic, but you'll be able to focus it if you study and work with your Saturn. And, and uh, of course, some of them do and some of them don't. And uh, uh, what bothers me is that those who don't, don't ever accomplish what they are capable of doing. They continue down the, that same rocky road, no matter what life may present to them. Now, you know, there's a, there's a question about Trump's uh, birth time. Uh, I, I'm fairly convinced that he's 29 degrees ascendant, uh, the 10-something uh, 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 time. And that puts Regulus, the kingmaker, right on his ascendant. Uh, it's almost as if it didn't matter what Donald Trump did, he was going to be, you know, maybe not president, because there's somebody else born with that who isn't, but he was going to be successful and have certain things he was going to be able to walk into it. When Regulus is on the ascendant, it also implies that if the king does not use his power correctly, it will be a tremendous fall. Now, let's see what happens. You know, yeah. I, I'm not going to, I, you know, I mean, obviously a part of our job is to predict, and I do, uh, and I have made my predictions, and, I, and they're all over the place. Anybody who wants to see them, they're on my website or they're on Facebook, whatever. I don't keep my opinions uh, quiet. But uh, I also understand that things can go in different directions. Now, what, what does the astrology say about the economy? Well, we've already talked about that. In my opinion, we're heading into a crash. Yeah. And it's going to be a severe crash because we're not going to have the tools in place that we had in 2008 to 2010. There'll be no way to recover from it. And this is, the, this is what I was trying to get to at earlier, was that whenever we have an aspect that's difficult, and we can see the aspect as being difficult, we know it's a, what it's a harbinger of, the ability to step in and manifest that prior to it happening is critical. Like you say, you've got to work with these difficult things. When you work with them mm -hmm. and you dive into them as opposed to running from them, you can find a way to mitigate that and come out somewhere successful. You may come out in the exact opposite direction. That's the polarity. The, the, you know, this, the, well, what, the, do you, what do you think the, what do you think the country would have been like if Roosevelt had lost oh, I and know. he wasn't president? I know. That, that depression would have continued, I don't know, who knows? Well, it may have been invaded, you know, can, it may have been, maybe Germany would have won the war and invaded us, maybe Japan would have invaded us, I mean, you know, maybe they oh, would I, have... I'd say there's a pretty good chance that Germany would have certainly won the war in Europe. Yeah. There's a good book written a few years ago called Fatherland, it takes place in, uh, in 1960, uh, Hitler is still alive, he has won the war in Europe, and uh -huh. President Kennedy, President Joseph Kennedy, oh, Joseph Jack's Kennedy. father, right, right, goes, right. Goes to goes to meet uh, uh, Hitler. It, it's really a, a quite, a, and it's got to do with a you know a, a police investigator and whatever. There's subplot, but the whole premise was I thought was was good. And a lot of people write these kinds of books, what if history books, and I always enjoy them because they give you a chance to say, well, yeah, you know what, uh, if you make a left instead of a right, you know, you know the the butterfly effect. If you go back to ancient times and you step on a butterfly, Hitler wins the war. <laughs> Yeah, no, because I mean, that the, butterfly didn't give birth to a whole family of butterflies who were eaten by this, and that turned to this, and then the blah, 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 blah. And we are all, all so interconnected that, you know, astrology shows us what might be, not what necessarily has to be. That's, of course, been your point today, and I agree. I think that's exactly right. But what do we do? Now, in the midterm elections, just to bring this down to, you know, to Earth, so to speak, <clears throat> I think we see... A big reversal of power. Does that mean Donald Trump disappears? Of course not. Does that mean the Republicans aren't going to fight? No, of course not. If anything, the fight is going to get nastier and more partisan, if that's at all possible. At this point. <laughs> I can't imagine it getting more so, but you go ahead. Well, wait until the, the uh, Supreme Court. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to see serious problems. You know, uh, uh, I don't know if you and your listeners know FDR. Uh, in 19, late 1930s, I think, uh, decided to double the number of Supreme Court justices. I did not know which that. By the, which, by the way, is not unconstitutional. 
nowhere in the Constitution does it say how many Supreme Court justices there should be. Uh, but the Congress wouldn't allow him, including his own Democratic uh, uh, backers, because they were trying to block his, his uh, New Deal policies. And so he, he decided to double the Supreme Court justices. Uh, it is not, it, it, and the number of justices has changed through the years. And most people don't pay attention to that. They're not going to study this stuff. But uh, it's very possible that if things become too much, if, if part of our government truly does not represent the large majority of what people want, you have to change the government. Yeah. That is what the Second Amendment is really about. I don't think it has anything to do with hunting moose or, or protecting your family in a parking lot. It has to do with militias that, are, that should be allowed to protect us against any government that doesn't serve our needs. It was, it was actually drawn up because of the English, not because we expected to be fighting our own government. Well, it is, it's, it's um, intended, I think it's intended for outside interference, outside intervention on us as opposed to internal. But it could say, I could see it well, going internal. Well, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. It, 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 really, it really is. I mean, it was originally because of the British, yes. So we could have militias that could come up. But, uh, you know, again, the Constitution is supposed to be a living uh, document, one that changes with the times, right. which is why but I'm it goes not through a, it goes through a, It goes through a process to change. It has to go through a litigation process to change. You don't just go and change it. Well, there have been times when uh, the Supreme Court has, has actually... Uh, made changes, but it's supposed to be through legislation. This is why we have three parts to our government: yeah, the executive, yep, the yep, judicial, yep. and and the, uh, the mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the legislative. But uh, you know, things are breaking down. Uh, Pluto, again, to use the astrology, Pluto breaks down everything. When you have a very serious Pluto aspect happening, um, you really feel it. You yeah. feel like you're, you're torn to shreds. There's nothing left. I don't know where to stand. I, you know, a lot of people get very emotional under Pluto aspects. Well, we, we're about to go through the biggest Pluto aspect imaginable, the Pluto return. Yeah. And of course, as, as uh, 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 the, I forget his name at the moment, philosopher said, God is a comedian playing to an audience that's afraid to laugh. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Voltaire. That's Voltaire, Voltaire. Voltaire, Voltaire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as God would, would do, not only are we going through a Pluto return, but we're doing it with Mars and Jupiter and Saturn sitting there, too, at the same time. So, obviously, there's going to be a spanking. <laughs> what, what do you do with your money? People say to me, what do I do with my, with my money? Well, I have a couple of, uh, of clients, business clients, who are paying heed to what I'm saying. So, they're putting a lot of money in cash. So that when the crash happens, they can go in and buy stocks. Yeah, yeah. You know, every time the market crashes, what you do is you run and you buy. You don't sell. Of course, when you when all your money is, is being flushed and you're scared, that's when the panic hits and everybody runs and sells at the worst possible time. And other people who are a little bit older, I say to them, you need to protect yourself. You need to take some of that money at least and put it in cash. I don't care if you put it under your, your mattress. Or you, want, or you put it, you know, I mean, the banks aren't going to, to completely default, although they almost did in 2008. Yeah, they did. Remember, they, they had to double the, uh, the FDIC. Insurance. So what do you think would have happened if they had taken that TARP money, the money that was allocated that Obama authorized $700 billion? Supposing they had taken that, distributed that across the United States to individual taxpayers, you know, IRS registered people. In, it would have been in, meaningless. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, listen to my theory. Supposing they had done that, and they dropped all that money into the into the hands of the American people, and they went out right. and bought TVs and went to movie theaters and bought and went on vacation and bought new cars. Those things would all stimulate the economy. Why wouldn't they have taken that approach as a for, as opposed to well, putting all the burden first, back first on us? All, yeah, but <clears throat> first of all, uh, now the, what was ultimately done with the banks? Uh, I, I, I'm not particularly thrilled with because, again, they let everybody off and, and they, you know, they simply took all that money, reinvested it in the stock market, and they're all, they're all reaping the rewards. But you take a lot of money like that and you just pour it into cash. Well, first of all, as soon as that money is gone, it's gone. It's not going to regenerate. It will go back into the economy, perhaps. But what they did by lowering interest rates by bailing out the banks, by then ultimately forcing some of the restrictions, uh, the Dodd-Franks and so on, uh, 
is to prevent this from happening, at least immediately again, uh, and, and putting a sense of security and stability under your feet so that, you know, you're a small business owner and things are going okay. You say, well, I'll hire two more people. Now you've given somebody a job. You know, the old, the old saying, you, know, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, and you so feed him for a life. Right, exactly. Yeah, give him $50,000, you open up a fish store. Um, but you see my well, logic. If people, if that money had been put back into the economy, you don't think that that would have generated people buying? And because American are consumers, so they consume, they go out and they take that money and they spend it. Would they? Would they have spent it, or would they have put it in into their mattress, like you say? You know I've, how many jobs were lost in two thousand eight? Oh yeah, I, I I know very well. I was one of them. <laughs> those jobs, those jobs were not going to suddenly come back because everybody got a few thousand dollars in their pocket, and then it, once that money's gone, they don't have a job. What they needed to do was create work, create an, an income flow. And remember, even to this day, many, many middle class and working class people have never recovered from this recession. No, and the, uh, and the, unemployment, one, one number, the, reason for, the, the unemployment numbers are way off. They show unemployment being low because they're counting part-time workers. They're counting people who have three or four jobs to equal what they used to have is one. It's a wide, right. wide number. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but even still, they, you know, but, but, but. A lot of small businesses are doing quite well. A lot of medium-sized businesses. They, they, look, the issue ultimately always comes down to how we divvy up the goodies. If 1% is going to get 90%, I think you, uh, the numbers are somewhere around 80-something percent of the stocks are owned by less than 5% of the of I America. believe that. Of course, it's, that's the whole disparity. And, right. So the stock market goes up and up and up and up and up and up, and you and me and your friends, they're not uh, making any money unless they're going to buy stocks. Right. Well, if, if wages have been stagnant for a long time, too. So. Right. So putting, just putting cash out there. See, I, I've, I've heard this argument before. I don't think there's anything wrong. I think even Mike Bloomberg had a, a thought about it, that if you distribute a certain amount of cash to people... But that's not going to... I, you know, I mean, it's, I, th I agree with giving money... I'm not going to give what I give to a charity. I live in New York City where there are homeless people all over the place. I walk around and give that money out to people that say to me, thank God I can, I can buy a cup of coffee. I can do something with it. If I give the money to a charity and maybe 10% of it actually gets distributed and blah, blah, blah. So there is something to be said for the direct payment to the individual. Right. But there's something much more powerful in putting together... Um, a foundation, a strong, secure, Saturnine situation. Remember, the answer to 2020 is going to be Saturn. Right, I agree with that. Yeah. That's, that's going to make or break what's what. How do we you know, clearly define where that Saturn belongs? How do we make those decisions? Well, you know. Well, I think it's going to be about accountability. It's going to be about doing the right thing. It's going to be about reversing things that have gone this way. I think the reversing of you know, so we have this ping, like this um, ping pong game between the Democrats and Republicans. Somebody goes in and starts a regulation. Somebody else comes along and deregulates it. Then the company comes along and re-regulates re again. In that right. exchange is where, the, is where the problem lies. And uh, the correction, I think, will come from doing the right thing. And that may be cutting corners. It may be resources. It may be any number of Saturn, any Saturnian things like you mentioned. Well, we'll have to see. Obviously, I, I don't think that Donald Trump gets reelected, no matter what happens in the midterms. Of course, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, if the Democrats really do take over Congress, well, then they'll blame the Democrats in two years after that and reelect Donald. And back and forth and back and forth. And all that's you know, certainly true. I believe in a free uh, democracy, even if they elect somebody I don't particularly care for. If it's a fair and free election, that's what the people want. Right. I think it was Harry Truman that says we get the government we deserve. That's true. So, you know, okay. But that's so as long we, as there's not inf inf election tampering as well, or election interference. Well, you know something? <clears throat> Even then, because we could have stopped that. <clears throat> 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 there's, we nothing that, there's nothing going on that we don't have the technology to prevent. It's that we don't want to waste the time and the money and who cares and blah, blah, blah. Well, what about a scenario, could, what about a scenario where... Uh, the electric grid, you know, a hard, fast, Capricornian sure. kind of thing mm -hmm. gets compromised in some way. I mean, 
you can't get a bank statement now that's paper to save your life. You, you'd have to go to this to bank. And I can't. Have- I can't even get my Verizon files filled by mail anymore. They stopped doing it. Right. I said I get. I have sixty three hundred unanswered emails. I want it by by mail. And she says to me, "Sorry, not going to do it." Wow. So yeah, and and of course there are a lot of restaurants in New York that are cashless. After 9-11, I was down, I was at my friend, I was staying with my friend Jenny Lynch, wonderful astrologer in lower Manhattan. Uh, and I had been predicting this 9-11 for about a year on her, her uh, uh, Manhattan cable TV show. And when it happened, of course, you know, she was, I, we were, it was horrible. We tried to film a show, but we were too freaked out by it, frankly. Um, and uh, she, she left town. She went out to the Hamptons and I stayed uh, on St. Mark's Place. And I had to carry her electric bill with me or the National Guard wouldn't let me below 14th Street if I went uptown. We had no trucks delivering food, no credit cards, nothing. Nothing worked. I knew a few restaurant owners, so we ran up a bill. And then when, you know, we all came back on, everybody paid, you know, you know it was, we were on the honor system for a while. We were all so freaked out by it. And of course that could happen. Chris. And in fact, it, the fact that it hasn't happened yet is the biggest shocker to me. But eventually, somebody's going to some some you know how did Donald Trump put it? Four hundred pound guy in his bed is going to push a button, and the grid is going to go down, and everybody will freak out. It'll be horrible. It'll be a few years, and the government will give out food, and then you know we'll get back on our feet and go about our business. But I think the, ram- ram- the ramifications of such a thing is it points to sort of that, you know, that, that constellium of <clears throat> large, major correction. <clears throat> if you can't get, everything is done electronically. All your deposits are electronic. Everything, all your stamp- savings. If all that gets wiped out or it doesn't work anymore, you can't get gas for your car. You can't get money out of the ATM. Your phone doesn't work. Right. You can't. What do we do? What do you do in a situation? That is, that's, 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 you know, apocalypse now. <laughs> this is why people are survivalists. Yeah, no, I know. They this are. This is why there are all of these groups all over this country and in every state where people are armed and they have, you know, uh, dried meat and beans and whatever. I mean, look, Chris, it's not that different from when we everybody built bomb shelters. When you think you're going to lay in a bomb shelter and after a couple of weeks you're going to come out and everything will be fine, you'll go to the grocery store. You know, on God's sakes, if, if that ever happens, I want to be at ground zero. You know, look at that bright light. Yeah, and really, then it's all oh. over. You don't have to worry about it. Mm. Yeah, right. Well, if the grid falls to that extent, good God, you can't even imagine. I mean, it really, it'll be absolutely fine. You'll see the best and the worst of humanity. You'll see people giving half of their sandwich to somebody else, and people will help. And, they'll catch. and then you'll see people raping, pillaging, stealing, burning, you know, whatever they can do. Right. So obviously, if, if society falls apart, there's a brilliant book by Isaac Asimov. It started as a short story. It was called Nightfall. And he turned it into a novel with somebody else. I have it somewhere in my, in my uh, library. It's about a civilization that I think has five or six sons. And every thousand years, they all line up in an eclipse. Uh-huh. And, for, and the light ends, <clears throat> and they destroy civilization. Huh. It's really a, a brilliant story. You ever get a chance? And then what happens, beyond, what happens beyond that? It, 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 it begins again? It, begin, it starts over again? You rebuild? Starts over again. And for a thousand years. And, and when the story takes place, of course, this is considered a myth. What do you mean, a thousand years? No, no, we've been, and, and the scientists are, are, are preparing. They say this is going to happen again. They understand. And uh, the civilization refuses to believe them, and it all happens again. Huh. I'm not going to give it, do it justice. Read it. It's really, it's a quick book. He always wrote <clears throat> very fast stuff. I always loved his writing. And it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, course. no, it is. So, good. But I mean, I think of that. So I'm not trying to play, I'm not trying to be an alarmist here. I'm just saying, what if that were to happen? That would be you know, because we're so dependent upon electricity. We sort of painted ourselves in this corner where everything is electronic now because of the Web. Mm-hmm. If that all goes south, the people you don't talk to who your next door neighbors are now because you're too busy being on Facebook talking to somebody across the globe. <laughs> You'll be knocking on that neighbor's door to say, "Can I borrow some money, or can I get some gasoline for my generator?" You're, you know, that's that's right. that's and that's it'll shift everything because people do not 
talk to their neighbors next door. They, they talk to somebody across the country on Facebook like they're their best friend and they may not even have met them, but they don't know their next door neighbor. And this is going to drive a community-based sort of resurgence of getting back to the humanities piece, I think. This is, this is sort of what the age of Aquarius is all about, in my view, is that it's a collection of people returning to the basic human instincts of connection with one another, tribalism, working with each other to survive, because that's the only method we have left. I see that very clearly, and I think people should protect themselves in that way by associating with a tribe of some sort. So you've got a little bit of a, a cushion there to cover you through in, in a tighter time. You work better when you're united as opposed to being a solo operator. Absolutely, but... Uh, well, you see, unfortunately, the term tribalism has a very bad connotation oh, I right now that, because we have become so tribalist. But you know something else, though? I mean, there's a lot of ways to view this, Chris. I, don't forget that Aquarius, the 11th house, rules large corporations and groups. It's not the individual, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that it's just, in some ways the age of Aquarius actually represents more uh, Amazons and Googles and apples, and that that is exactly what we are heading into. Now, remember, an age lasts 2,000 years. It's like, you know, the, the Piscean age more or less began with the birth of Jesus. It, uh, it took until 1450 before Martin Luther redirected the direction of the church and of the religion and so on and so forth. So things happened during that period, and we're going to see the rise of, of tremendous corporations, and then they'll probably be, you know, overrun and destroyed, and then the other people will rise up again. So, I, you know, I, I think we have, to, we have to go beyond that and be prepared for when there is no electricity. And, and well, there will always be electricity. Uh, well, but, but the way that we deal with it now on the grid, look, there are people who think that Telsa was inventing a worldwide free electrical system. Uh, there's a great show on I forget, history or one of those. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, Tesla, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen right. it, yeah. And, and, you know, he was really quite a, quite a smart guy. Yeah, it's incredible. And, 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 and there's also people, you know, who believe that all the pyramids around the world were the same thing. I don't know the answer to that. Nobody does. No. It makes for great, uh, you know, cocktail party chatting. Um, but, but what's more important to us right now, you, me, and all of your listeners, is, you know, I want to live a good life. I want to spend time with the people I love. I want to go to the movies. I want to you know, see the beach a couple of times a year. I want, to, I want to live my life. I want to be happy. How do I protect myself so that that's the case? And it's a combination of things. But certainly, I agree with you. You know, I live in a building in New York that is the closest thing to home that I've ever felt since I left my parents' house. Interesting. It is, everybody's been here for many, for many years, and half of my neighbors don't ever lock their doors. Which That's cool. I find That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And then it really is. We have a doorman, and, and it's very secure, and they put cameras. It's not crazy. It's not Big Brother. But it's, it really has a sense of, and if something happens to one of the neighbors, other people come come forward and they're there for them. That's what they're I'm saying. That's friends, the base, that's the basic human quality. I think that we're, that is sorely lacking in this in this social media world in which we've entered. But yes, well, there are connections. Lacking in New York. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, of course, New York has always been known for that. But broadly speaking, all of us are in the so this collective social media world, which is great. I think it's wonderful. It's got great things about it. You connect with people you haven't seen in years, but it's the people you don't know that become part of your circle of influence. Those people mm -hmm. are not going to matter when the power goes down because who's going to matter is who's out, your, out in your backyard or who's next door to you in your apartment building. That's, that's what's going to matter. And that's what's going to be the major shift because we've gotten so far away from that. We've, be, we've put this huge veil of uncertainty and you know this, this, this social media veil in between us that removes us from the basic human elements of what we need to be, which is, you know, to be with your neighbor, go out and talk and slap somebody in the well, back. I and wonder, have a, have... I want, you know, you and I live in big cities or you you know you're right. a suburb yep. but but i wonder if you're out in middle america in small towns if they have that same sense do they sit and and play with facebook all day or do they go down to the local feed store and and chat like they did 50 or 100 years ago That's i don't know question. i don't, I, pull, I, don't get out. I, sus I suspect that people in the midwest uh, i mean i'm making a broad generalization i think they're probably more 
physically connected than perhaps those of us in the in the big intellectual centers on the east and west coast. I think that's just more the right. case. But right. I, think I so. mean, you know, it's interesting. You know, these are all good topics. They're, they're worthy of discussion. They're worthy of our notice, I think, more than anything else. I think the point that we're trying to make here in our discussion about this is that we are, we are ramping up to a time where I think that if we are best informed, we, are, if we, are, we will be best prepared when we're best informed. And that's what astrology provides. It provides a base for us to be informed about what potentially could happen. Could the end of the world come? Of course. Could it be a whole new, bold new beginning, a new renaissance? Of course. I think both those options are available. What I want to stress right. is that the potential for the change is going to happen regardless of how we feel about it. We have the ability to d- determine the outcome, or if we have any influence in the outcome, we need to aim towards the, the greater renaissance rather than the destruction of the world. I guess that's what it comes down to. And I'm not trying well, to be... I've never, I've never been a doomsday person, <clears throat> but I don't see any, any point to it. If I'm wrong, I look like an idiot. And if I'm right, there's nobody there to pay me. It doesn't <laughs> make any right. sense. I, I don't think the world is ending. I think we're going to go on for a while. I yeah. think that the environment is the most important issue facing us. And that's probably the one thing I think that I would say, like I said, my idea of having a common enemy, the common enemy may very well be the environment. And the environment is something we cannot overlook because that is, mm-hmm. we, you know, we're on this, like you said, we're on this great gigantic blue ball and and we're not going anywhere else. You can't go down, you can't get off the planet and go down the street and get a, a, a coffee. You're on the planet. You're not going anywhere else but there. So that's the real conundrum. Anyway, we have run out of time, Mitch, as I thought we would. I knew this would happen. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's life, old boy. Uh, so let's pick this conversation up down the road further. As we get closer to the 2020, we'll be able to have plenty of time to talk before then. In the meantime, I want people to come to you and see you and, you, and visit you. Whenever you see Mitch uh, having a lecture, go to see it. It's well worth it. It's educational. It's informative. He's a funny guy. He's, he's comfortable on stage. You can tell he's got his music chops with him because he loves the timing. And uh, I think it's wise for people to go and hear what you have to say, wherever you may be. Uh, your, your, Mitch's website is MitchAstro.com. He's great for financial astrology, medical astrology, and his books are really cool. They're interesting because they use astrology as the foundation. So those of you who love astrology, who listen to the show all the time, if you love literature at the same time, Mitch has found a way to combine those two elegantly, and it's great. And as I said, he's also a great musician. I've been encouraging him to get his music out there, but he's a little reluctant. Hopefully Mm -hmm. you'll make some progress on that one, though, bud. Thank you, Chris. That's great. It was great, great talking. To you. Yeah, same here, Mitch. And uh, let's 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 pick this up again in maybe six months, and we'll see where we are. I bet you you're, we're going to be right on the target with what you're saying. So I'm pretty confident. Very cool. All right. Okay, good. Very good. Take care, man. Bye. You've been listening to Turning of the Wheel with your host Chris Fisher. To schedule a reading with me or to order artwork, you may visit my website at www.turningofthewheel.com. That's www.turningofthewheel.com or you can call me at 978-393-1036. Thank you. And as always, be open to possibilities.